That was almost a little unnerving. Usually I get up here, you're talking away. I got to get your attention. Everybody was quiet before I got here. Welcome to services at the 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us. We invite you back to every opportunity you have. I want you to know that it's always our, our effort to conduct our services according to the direction we've been given in the, in the Bible and following the example of the first, testament, or first century church. If you have any questions about what we do, why we do it, we'd be happy to answer those. Please don't hesitate to ask about them. If you are visiting, uh, if you feel comfortable, please uh, fill out one of the attendance cards. You can place those in the, the collection baskets that are at the rear of the auditorium. There are opportunities there. If there's something we can do for you, a, a call, a visit, or a Bible study, there's opportunities to note your needs. Those who will be taking a public part in our services this morning, Tim Wells will be leading our singing. Daryl Haig will have our opening prayer. Bill McFarland will be reading our scripture. Albert Baltzer will be leading our minds at the Lord's table. And Roger will be speaking to us on the topic of what is truth. So we'll let Tim get things started. Number four. Number four. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, sign the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, sign the glory. Revive us again. We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, sign the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, sign the glory. Revive us again. Our glory and praise to the God of our grace, who has bought us and sought us and guided our ways. Hallelujah, sign the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. Revive us again, filling charred with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory, revive us again. the Lord's Supper will sing number 163, 163. Yeah. 
in the back side of the pew in front of you. There's a little purple container if you're new, and down on the top there's uh, there's the bread under the cellophane, and below the foil, of course, there's the fruit of the vine. Um, I wanted to read a verse, verses, First Thessalonians chapter 5, starting with verse 4, it says, but, and Paul's writing to the Gentiles, he says, but you are not <clears throat> in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet the hope of salvation, for God for God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And whenever he said who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. You can't live with him unless you put on Jesus in baptism. And it's been said here a million times by many people. Um, it doesn't matter how good you are out in the world. If you're before a judge and say you committed a very heinous crime, you could, you could say you're sorry but the judge is just going to just say you broke the law. And there's no mercy there. The law just, it would just convict you. You'd be sentenced to death or whatever the crime may be, a murder. Um, but to live with him, to live with Jesus, you have to accept the, the idea and the fact that he died for our sins. Um, that blood is what cleanses you. Everybody knows it, but it's so, so important because on the first day of the week, we have to break the bread, we have to drink the, fr the fruit of the vine, and please, when you wake up on the, on the first day of the week, um, never go through the motions. It's, um, if you wake up on a Sunday and you're busy, you're hustling, bustling, trying to get ready, whether you got kids or whatever, it's easy just to sort of go through the motions and and um, sort of show up to church. Never do that. It's so important just to remember the very basics. And um, so, if you would, let's give thanks for the for the bread. Almighty God, we thank you that we can take part in this emblem um, to remember. Um, your only, only begotten Son, your prized possession to sacrifice on the cross his body for our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, at this time, let's give, um, give thanks for the fruit of the vine. God, as we take this emblem of this juice, um, let us never forget the importance and the only way to the Father. The only way th to you, God, is through your Son, Jesus. That barrier of sin is removed. 
through the blood. And then we can confess our sins and be forgiven and be cleansed by the blood and be found, uh, be found pure on the day of judgment. In Jesus' name, amen. And at this point of the service, um, uh, we give thanks for the contribution. It's in the back of the auditorium. Again, if you're new and you don't know, um, just give, what, give whatever you feel like giving. That money's used for really good causes, really good things to um, further the work of the church and uh, to spread the, help spread the word of the kingdom. So if you would, let's give thanks for that. Almighty God, um, we pray that we give with generous hearts, and we pray that every fund, everything's used for your glory, God, in Jesus' name, amen. Number 282. Two eight two. before the lesson will be number 353, 353. If you're able to, please stand.
saw the following will also be number 554. 554. you bow with me, please? Dear Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for yet another beautiful day that we have here upon your earth. Thank you so much for everything that you give us and bless us with each and every day. Thank you for all the material blessings that we have and help each and every one of us to always remember how fortunate we are. We also thank you more than anything for the spiritual blessings that we have and as we gathered around the Lord's table this morning and <clears throat> remembered what your son did for us and the hope that we have because of that, we thank you once again for Jesus coming to this earth, you sending him down and him suffering, living that perfect life so that we can have the hope of a home in heaven with you someday and his blood cleanses us from all of our sins and shortcomings we thank you for that and we help we ask that you help each and every one of us to as we live throughout our daily lives to always remember that but also always do our best to do what is right not leave undone things that that should be done and just do our best to always live in a way that you would approve of. We ask as we continue throughout this worship service this morning, dear Lord, that we all stay attentive, we all stay alert, and we all put aside the thoughts of the world for a few more short minutes and focus on you, focus on your son, and focus on the message at hand. Help us to apply it to our everyday Christian walks so that we can serve you better. Please be with Roger as he's about to present this message and help him to remember all the things he studied and present as truth from your word to us. We thank you for the elders and the deacons here and each and every person that does things that are seen and that are not seen to keep this congregation alive and Help us to have many more years of service in your kingdom. <clears throat> God, guard and direct us, dear Lord, and please be with us every day. And on that last great day, please help us to receive that home in heaven with you if found worthy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of John, chapter 18, verses 33 through 38. John 18, 33 through 38, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? an excellent job, Albert. Thank you for those very meaningful thoughts. 
Not to find Cheryl. Singing's okay, Tim. The singing's great. It's a joy to be able to assemble on a day like this and to be reminded of just how blessed we truly are. Let me urge you, especially as the Thanksgiving holiday approaches, count your blessings, to name them one by one, and to know that the source of every good and perfect gift really is God our Father. We're looking at one of the most important and penetrating questions the human mind will ever consider. What is truth? Let me set the stage for you. The text that Bill read a moment ago from John 18 is an exchange between Pilate, governor of Judea, and Jesus, king of kings and lord of lords. Pilate knew that the politically expedient thing to do was to sentence Jesus to death by means of crucifixion because those he governed demanded such action. To keep a position of authority, you must be flexible and willing to bend to the will of those you govern. Pilate knew that should he buck the trend, so to speak, and go with his gut and do what was right, it could well jeopardize his position. What should he do? It was a perplexing question. So he examined the Lord. If you look at the narrative carefully in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll find that cumulatively, three times, Pilate examined the evidence and three times reached the same conclusion. He's an innocent man. He has done nothing worthy of death. His own wife warned him, have nothing to do with this just person. And yet the people pleaded, let him be crucified. He had a political ploy which he determined to utilize to remove himself from the dilemma. At this time of year, it's around the Passover in Jerusalem. It was customary for the governor to release someone from his jail. He gives them a choice. There is the notorious Barabbas. He is a murderer, a thief, a leader of insurrection, I don't think any right-thinking person would want him as a next-door neighbor. And then there's Jesus. Whom do you choose? And they chose Barabbas. Jesus questioned, was questioned by Pilate, Are you really the king of the Jews? And Jesus responded, in language that is so clear and yet to this day seems to be unheard by the masses. My kingdom is not of this world. It's a different kind of kingdom, a different kind of animal. It's a spiritual kingdom. If it were of this world, yes, my servants would fight. I wouldn't be in this pickle. But this is not the kind of kingdom I have come to establish. And the truth supports... Jesus' acknowledgement. So Pilate demands, what is truth? You would think that's an easy question to answer today. But it really isn't. When I think of truth, I think of that which is absolute, certain beyond any degree of dispute. But that's an outdated and for many today an unacceptable definition of truth. Have you heard of universism? It's a relatively new term, a relatively new concept. I encountered it for the first time in 2006 in the Columbus Dispatch. My curiosity was piqued and so I did what everybody does. I googled it. 
And this is what I discovered from universism.org. And I want to quote it directly to you. Universists embrace the creative force of uncertainty, which is fundamental to human progress. We determine our meaning and purpose individually. Our understanding comes through personal reason and experience. Our universe is a beautiful constellation of ideas whose light is threatened only by the black hole of faith, unquote. Now, I have to tell you, that doesn't make a great deal of sense to me. It's a bunch of gobbledygook from my personal perspective, so I have to dumb it down to understand it, and the whole concept is basically this. Truth is whatever you say it is. And so for the last decade or two, I've been listening carefully primarily to our politicians and our educators who are constantly speaking about her truth or his truth, your truth, their truth, because truth is whatever you say it is. But that's untruth. But it's winning the hearts and minds especially of the young today because in our institutions of higher learning, this is the philosophy that is being embraced. And it goes right along with the notion that you dare not be critical or judgmental of anyone or anything because the best you can do is express your own truth or your own opinion. And who are you to criticize others, their truths and their opinions? The outcome of such thinking is disastrous, and we're beginning to see it unfold. A second concept that is older and perhaps more understood is the concept of relativism. All truth is relative. What may be true for you may not be true for another, and it comes out of the whole idea of situation or contextual ethics. The notion that you can never speak with any degree of certainty because there are no absolutes. Of that, they are absolutely certain. So you can't say that some actions are always wrong and some things are always right. It depends on the situation because all truth is relative. Well, if you haven't guessed it yet, I am not I mean, a disciple of universism, nor do I buy into the notion that all truth is relative. I believe in moral certainty, that truth is absolute, that some things are always wrong and some things are always right, and I don't make that determination on my own. I make that determination based on what I find in God's Word and the instruction of Solomon in Proverbs 23, 23, buy the truth and sell it not. If you say, but you can't be that dictatorial, if that's the language you prefer, I'm merely echoing to you what I believe the scriptures actually reveal. That we can know the truth, that we can know that we know the truth, and we can act upon it. Did Pilate really not know what he should do in the setting that is described in John 18? Bill read it a moment ago. His dilemma was not that he didn't understand right and wrong. He didn't recognize the difference between good and evil. He didn't know what was true and what was fiction. He knew the truth. He just chose to disregard it. This is our world today. And to that world we respond that only the truth of God's word will really address the problems that we face every day and provide solutions and direction. Let me take you to John chapter 1 for a moment, just cite some passages from John and elsewhere in Scripture. 
chapter 1, verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The real source of truth is divine. The real source of truth is in the person of Jesus Christ and in the revelation of His life and ministry. In verse 17, the text goes on to say, The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. When Jesus encountered the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well and they engaged in a conversation about worship, what did Jesus say? She said, we think that we should worship in this mountain and you say in that city. And he said, those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. Did you know that there are a whole host of things that pass for acceptable worship today that have no basis in the truth and yet people think that they're doing God's bidding and are going to be prepared for eternity when Jesus returns? But worship that is not supported by truth cannot be acceptable worship. We worship the Father, we don't worship each other, we worship God and we do so with proper attitude following His instruction, the truth. In John 8, verse 31, Jesus said to the Jews of his day, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you or set you free. You say, well, what truth in context is he talking about here? The answer to that question he gives in John 17, 17, when he prays to the Father in behalf of his disciples then and now, sanctify, that is, set them apart through truth. Your word is truth. Have you ever really considered why we spend so much time in the study of the Bible and so much time in presentations from the pulpit simply reminding ourselves of what the Scriptures say? And the answer is very simple. This is the only source of real truth that we can expose ourselves to. Oh, there are all kinds of man-made ideas out there that we can have access to, but none of them provide the assurance that we find in this sacred book. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but by me. There are so many other passages that I could highlight for you. I would urge you to get your concordance. Simply look up the word truth and then take note of all of those passages in both testaments that speak to the truth. And test everything that you hear in light of what you read in God's word. Here you find the truth. You're not always going to find the truth on the internet. Have you learned that yet? It is not really a reliable source of information. And it is becoming less reliable every day as the truth is censored. But if you go to this book, you confront truth day in and day out. And of all the things you need to know, this is what you need to know first. So if we ask, what is truth today, here's the biblical answer. It is that which is revealed in God's Word by God's Holy Spirit. This book is unique among all books because its source is heavenly. It is not the product of men's minds, but the maker of all minds, God himself. Through his Holy Spirit, he has revealed his will, his word, to his creation. Look at verse 26. But when the Helper comes, paraclete in the original, comforter sometimes is the translation, a clear reference to God's Holy Spirit. When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. You want to know the facts about Jesus? Go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Holy Spirit's revelation of him is in fact truth. You can count on what that record says. 
turn to other sources, and I, I promise you that you will be disappointed if you are searching for truth. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority. Listen, he will not speak on his own authority. That's why the Bereans in Acts 17, 11 are commended. They were more noble than the Thessalonians. They received the word with all readiness and they searched the scriptures daily because they knew that the scriptures were authoritative, that they conveyed the will of the Father by means of the Holy Spirit's work. He didn't declare himself. He declared the will of the Father. When you go to the Word, you have that which is revealed by God's Holy Spirit. You have the truth. Yes, it is true that the Bible doesn't touch on every little thing in life, but it touches on everything that matters. It's not a science book. It's not a manual for repairing a washing machine. It's not a dictionary. It's not even an encyclopedia. But it is divine revelation, the truth, from start to finish. The truth is not only that which was revealed by the Holy Spirit, it's that which was confirmed by the apostles. And I've cited for your consideration Mark 16, verse 20. Jesus has given the disciples what is typically referred to today as the Great Commission. We all know it. Most of us can quote Mark 16, 15, and 16. Sadly, that's often where we stop. But the text continues through verse 20. And in verse 20 it says, And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message. And what is the message? Truth by accompanying signs. I can do nothing miraculous. Anyone who says today that they have miraculous abilities are deceiving you. Don't be suckered in because of their falsehoods. But in the first century, those early disciples went everywhere preaching the word, Acts 8, verse 4, and in many cases confirmed the message as truth by the things which they were able to do. Why did that not continue up until the present? Because once confirmed, the need for confirmation no longer exists. The truth, as it was proclaimed by those early disciples, was confirmed by the things they did. Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer. They met a man who was lame. He was looking for a contribution, silver or gold. And Peter said, we have none. What we do have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise, take up your bed and walk. Do you know that even the critics of our Lord could not deny that a notable miracle had taken place? But rather than being impressed by the message confirmed by the word, they sought to destroy the preachers. They missed the whole point over and over again in Scripture. As God clearly indicated through the promise of his son to those early disciples, the truth, the message of Jesus, was confirmed by signs, miracles, and wonders which the Spirit enabled those early disciples to do to give validity to the message which they proclaimed. The word having been confirmed, we can now proclaim the truth as confirmed on the pages of this wonderful book. What is truth? That which the Holy Spirit revealed. That which confirmed the message of the disciples. That which faithful preachers will always preach. So much of what passes for preaching today has little to do with God's word. Can you preach the truth while ignoring the truth? I'm at a loss to understand how that would be possible. 
Are you saying, preacher, that you have to cite book, chapter, verse after every statement? Not necessarily. Do you know that not once in the entire Bible does a single writer or a single sermon con con contain a book, chapter, verse reference? The closest they get is it's written in the Psalms or the prophets or in the law. It was not till the 6th century, 16th century that the Bible was actually divided into chapters and verses. And when we talk about preaching book, chapter, verse, we're simply saying we need to make the truth as obvious and clear and enable people to find it as quickly as possible. And this is what happens when we cite passages like 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. I charge you, Paul said to Timothy, this is the last letter that the Spirit inspired Paul to write to the young preacher Timothy. I think I have a message scheduled perhaps early next year, if not late this year, on final words. I've given a lot of thought to that. What would I say if I had, I knew I had a week, a month, just a year to live? Would it change a lot of things? Probably. Paul's writing his last words. What does he say to Timothy? Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And he says, in essence, and the reason is because that's not what people want to hear. And they'll do everything they can to discourage the truth and will desire to embrace error, but preach the word. Because the word is truth again. John 17, 17. We preach the word, we preach the truth. We don't preach the truth when we don't preach the word. And it's the word that is able to save our souls. It is the word that is able to build us up and give us an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. It is the word that is able to make us wise unto salvation. Three passages of scripture. Find them. They're there. They tell us how important the truth is. Without it, there is no hope. So preachers preach the word. They preach the truth in the first century. The truth is just as needed in the 21st century. Truth is that which is supported by the church. There's an interesting statement in Paul's first letter to Timothy about his desire to visit with Timothy he says in verse 14 I hope to come to you shortly but if I tarry long I have written these things unto you that you may know how you ought to behave yourself I'd underscore that word behave I have in recent months encountered more than one person who has told me that how you behave how you live what you do really has no bearing on where you will be eternally. Just as long as you trust Jesus and invite him into your heart. But here's what the truth says. I have written unto you, hoping to come unto you shortly. But if I tarry, if I'm delayed, I want you to know how to behave yourself. When you walk out of here today as God's child, God expects you to behave as one of his children. Not as the world. Not in order to be saved, but because you are saved. Not to deserve, to merit, to achieve salvation, but because you have salvation through Jesus Christ as God's child. Behave as God's child. And what is the role of the church in all of this? The church is the pillar and buttress, the King James says, the support of truth. Any church that does not demand and uphold the truth of God's word is not Christ's church, ladies and gentlemen. And there are all kinds of institutions out here in this world professing themselves to be followers of Jesus who are football fields away from the word of God, the truth. The church will always uphold the truth. I have only one prayer for this congregation relative to your next preacher, that he be someone who is 
committed to preaching the truth. I don't care how old he is or how young he is. I don't care if he's short or tall, if he's thin or fat. I don't care if he has blue eyes or brown eyes or green eyes. It doesn't matter to me if he has hair or no hair. He just needs to preach the truth. And you need to support him in that. That's what the church does. That's what preachers do. Truth is that which is obeyed by sinners. 1 Peter 1, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly. Have a pure heart. You can't have a pure heart and live in rebellion to truth, by the way. You have obeyed that form of doctrine delivered unto you. That enables you to be born again, Peter is saying. The truth of God's word. Live by that truth every day. You know, the basic message of scripture for Christians can be summarized in what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 12. Treat people the way you want to be treated. That's the truth about our interactions, all interpersonal relationships in the home, in the school, in the community. Just treat people the way you want to be treated and you're going to be fine. Understand that it's never about you, it's always about him. And be selfless rather than selfish, as Paul argues in Philippians 2, citing the example of Christ himself. Look not every man on his own things, but also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And understand how important it is to be a giver rather than a getter. Because the real blessings in life come not from what we get, but from what we're able to give, as Jesus so argues in Acts 20. It's more blessed to give than it is to receive. If we have purified our souls through obedience to the truth, we will walk out of here having been cleansed by the blood of Jesus to treat everybody as we would want to be treated by them. To be generous and giving rather than constantly harping on how we're neglected and mistreated and folks just don't understand how important we are and how much we do. Just learn to be a giver as Jesus admonished. And know that it's not about you, it's always about him. That's what being purified through obedience to the truth will really accomplish. You will be transformed, remade into the person God calls you to be. Truth is that which we will ultimately be judged by. We spent some time in our Sunday morning Bible class this morning. I'm sorry so many of you missed that. You did miss the study of God's Word. I'm not sorry that you missed my teaching because the teacher never is the teacher that important. But the topic, God's Word, we need it. We all need it, and we need more of it and more of it because this truth in this book will someday judge us eternally. These are the words of Jesus that I will leave with you as we depart this morning. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. I really want to know this book so I can know the will of the Father and of his Son, my Savior, Obey it and live by it, knowing someday I will be judged by it. That's our plea every time we come to this setting. Know God's word, believe God's word, obey God's word, build your life on the truth, and when you're judged by it, you will not be disappointed. But ignore it now, and that is a regret you will carry with you into eternity. And you'll never be able to get rid of it. Don't let it happen. You know what you need to do? Then do it. Not later. Do it now. Come to him 
on his terms, which means you will believe that he was the Son of God, and that faith will motivate you to change your thinking and your doing. Repentance. It will give you the courage to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confession. And will lead you to that watery grave, that baptism that Albert spoke about here at the Lord's Supper just a few moments ago. And when you come out of the water, you will be cleansed by the blood of Jesus and added to his church, and your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and your future will be bright. But you must stay with the truth. So that when you are judged by it, he will say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. If that day were to come this day, where would you be for eternity? If you don't like the outcome, you can change it. I urge you to do that right now as together we stand and sing. That fire in the blood, fire in the blood, would you a evil a victory win? There's wonderful fire in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's fire in the blood, fire in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's side. There's wonderful fire in the blood. There is fire, fire, wonder working fire in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's fire in the blood, fire in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's fire in the blood, fire in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful fire in the blood. There is fire, fire, wonder working fire in the blood of the Lamb. There is fire, fire, wonder working fire. In the precious blood of the Lamb. This morning, Kelly Gray has come forward. Kelly has has been a Christian for many, many years, and life has uh, thrown challenges at her like it does to all of us and, and caused her to lose that focus that we all need to have that can happen to all of us at times. She comes forward this morning asking us for her prayers that she may continue to improve each day to face those challenges and to keep her focused on Christ just as we all need to do. Let's go to God in prayer on her behalf. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for you, so thankful for the, your plan for our lives. We're so appreciative that you understand we're imperfect people, that we do make errors, that at times we don't make the right choices. Father Kelly comes forward today as she embarks on her, her journey to return to you, to 
continue or to re replace her focus back on you. Father, we'd ask that you'd be with Kelly, that you'd strengthen her in those times when she's challenged, that you'd be with each and every one of us, that we might be a support and encouragement to her in that, in that effort. And Father, we'd help ask you to help each of us to be mindful of the fact that each of us faces those same temptations, those same challenges. Help us to see those times when we fail to meet the expectations you have for us, to come to you in repentance, knowing that you love us, that it is your desire for us to return to you, that we may have the hope of heaven. Father, we're so thankful for your son, his sacrifice on our behalf, that those times when we do fail, that we can still be redeemed to you. And it's in his name we come to you in prayer. I have a few announcements to share with you. Fortunately, our sick list is very short today. Norm Wilkinson is still in Marietta Memorial, and no visitors at this time, please. I'm sure he would appreciate cards, if that's something you can do with those as well. Winter quarter will be, getting, be starting here in December. The first and fifth will be the first days of classes for the next quarter. Uh, we are still in need of teachers and assistants for the various classes. If that's something that you can help with, there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Uh, material is ready to be picked up for those who have already signed up. And if you have any questions about being a teacher or being an assistant, maybe you'd like to assist and haven't done that in the past, or you'd like to get set up with someone who is teaching and assist this quarter, so maybe that's something you could do in the future. Uh, don't hesitate to see our deacons who are in charge of educational services. That's Michael Morgan and Tim Lowry. Do you have a reminder for, for folks uh, we've been announcing for some time that we're hopeful of um, men considering whether they are uh, qualified and ready to serve as deacons and elders? So I want to keep that in front of you. If that's something you've been considering, if you have any uh, discussions you'd like to talk about it, we're you know, available to, to talk to you about that and, and what the expectations and qualifications are. I'd also encourage you, if you're considering being a deacon, maybe speak to one of the, the current deacons uh, so that you have an idea of um, what they're doing and what we call upon them to do. And I will say that's a lot. We ask them to do a lot. So remind you that uh, when there's a burden, it's best shared by many people. So if you find yourself uh, qualified, ready to serve, we encourage you to step forward and do that. We invite you back every opportunity you have to be with us. We will uh, meet again this evening at 5 o'clock. Roger will just be speaking on the topic of what does Jesus want from me? And uh, you can read Romans 6, uh, verses 1 through 6, if you'd like to read the scripture that's associated with that. Following our final song, uh, Paul Jacoby will have our closing prayer. Look forward to seeing all of you this evening. Okay. Number 446, 446. We'll sing both verses and then the chorus. If you're able to, please stand.
Let's pray. Dear God, we continue thinking about Kelly and just pray that you will be with her and it helps each one of us to be an example to her. And God, we think of the weather you've given us this day and fall is crazy weather. It can be raining, it can be snowing, it can be 90 degrees or it can be freezing. But we know that you created it, you created this world, and we are thankful for that. And today we're thankful for Roger's preparation and his thoughts about truth and help us to remember in all situations to go to your word for guidance. And God, we know that this service is almost over and really the better part of our lives starts right now when we leave the building. And I know I, I cut grass and I blow leaves, so I'm not around people too much but I still have an obligation to be a Christian in what I do and how I do it. So as we leave this place, we ask that each one of us will try to be that example to let our light shine to the people around us in whatever we do to this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.